So we've heard another passage from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, another one that uh, is for some of us perhaps at least potentially a stumbling block as we try to wrestle with the words and put them in the context of not only our understanding of Scripture but also our experience of God and in particular these words. Paul wrote, Gentiles did not strive for righteousness, but they have attained it. But Israel, who did strive for righteousness, that is based on the law, did not. Let's pray. Help us, O oh God, as we reflect on these words of ancient text and as we hear them not only in the context of that old letter, but also in the context of our own realities. Help us, O oh God, to, to be so blessed by your presence that whatever words are spoken now, the word we hear will be your own. Amen. Here is another bit of scripture that makes you want to say, you've got to be kidding me. If I'm reading it right, the Jews took righteousness very seriously and worked hard to attain it, but they failed. Meanwhile, the Gentiles didn't care about righteousness and made no effort to become righteous, and yet they were. You've got to be kidding me. Paul seems to be suggesting here that his religious culture had what might be called a brownie point understanding of how a person gets right with God. They assume that it's possible to satisfy God through right behavior. In words of the prophets, God had shown them what is required. All they had to do was do it. And for them, the requirements of God are expressed in the law, the Ten Commandments, and the moral code which is built upon them. It's as if right behavior earns us points with God, and enough points will buy you a get-into-heaven-free card. This brownie point understanding of salvation continues in our own religious culture. When I'm asked to conduct the funeral service for somebody I don't know, there are usually members of the grieving family who feel obliged to persuade me that their beloved was a good person, as if my opinion might influence the dearly departed's claim on salvation. Uh, he always tried to do what was right, they'll say. She never said a bad thing about anybody. Uh, he, he, he was a good husband and father. At one time, she went to church every Sunday. He was as honest as the day is long. She wouldn't hurt a fly. Now, they might not use uh, these words, but what they're doing is arguing a righteousness that's based on right behavior. And those post-mortem defenders are giving me the final count of brownie points in the hope that their loved one has earned enough to qualify. And it makes sense, doesn't it? If you believe in God and that God has certain expectations for how we should behave, and you believe that those expectations are translated into do's and don'ts which are set down in Scripture as law, then what matters is how we behave, the extent to which our behavior complies with those directives. To be right with God, that is to be righteous, all we have to do is behave in the right way. And it does make sense. But then... Along comes this Paul guy who says that those who try to be right through right behavior will fail, and those who don't even try can achieve righteousness. You've got to be kidding me. We've heard before this paradox, that no matter how hard we try to earn brownie points of right behavior, they will never be enough to qualify as righteousness. We've heard it before because it's a conviction we assert every time we sing that, that great old hymn, Rock of Ages. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demand. Could my zeal no respite know, could my tears forever flow, all for sin could not atone. No matter how hard we try to do what God requires, we are bound to fail. We can never earn enough points 
to qualify, and it makes you want to say, you've got to be kidding me. Did you hear there's going to be another Beatles weekend in Belleville this fall? We can never uh, hear their music without being reminded of the impact that the Beatles had on uh, popular culture. And uh, that impact is in large measure stated by the simple statement of brownie point paradox that is contained in the words of one of their more, more famous and uh, often sung songs. It states the brownie point paradox, but it also suggests a strategy for resolving it. You know the words. There's nothing you can say that can't be done, nothing you can do that can't be done, nothing you can sing that can't be sung, nothing you can say, but you can learn how to play the game. There's nothing you can make that can't be made, no one you can save that can't be saved, nothing you can do, but you can learn to be you in time. It's easy. All you need is love. Love is all you need. So to paraphrase Lennon and McCartney, we cannot be or become more than we are able to be and become. But that's okay because it is enough for us, according to them, just to love. In other words, when it comes to brownie points of righteousness, the only ones that count are those we earn by loving. Love is all you need. It sounds like an echo of what Jesus said to all of us who would be his disciples. That his commandment is for us to love one another. The question is, can we, even by loving, earn enough brownie points to get right with God? A very different interpretation of the brownie point paradox is woven through the plot of the hit movie from a few summers ago, uh, The Dark Knight. I agree with the reviewers at the time that it was an exceptionally good film with several outstanding performances, uh, perhaps especially by the late Heath Ledger. Although it was primarily a superhero movie, the storyline was both dark and deep as it wrestled with the same paradox that preoccupied St. Paul. What is the connection between right behavior and righteousness. In case you missed it, Bruce Wayne puts on the Batman costume in order to, to do good in Gotham City, and he does plenty of good until a new villain arrives on the scene. The Joker is pure evil. He does bad things for the simple pleasure of being bad. More than that, he believes that everyone else is just as bad and that any goodness is a veneer, merely a veneer which can be scraped away by the right circumstance. The plot line culminates in a scene in which two large fairies are crossing a stretch of open water. One is filled with convicted criminals and the guards who are moving them from one prison to another. The other is filled with ordinary folks like you and me. Suddenly, both vessels lose all their power. They're dead in the water. Then the Joker broadcasts to both sets of passengers that he has placed on each boat enough explosives to blow it out of the water and that each one on each of the boats is a detonator which will destroy the other boat. He further advises the passengers on both boats that he will allow one set of passengers to survive if they will kill the others. But if both boats are still afloat at midnight, he himself will detonate both bombs and kill everybody. Now how's that for a moral dilemma? Either group could survive by killing the others. They have every reason to believe that to do nothing is for them to die. And as an added incentive, of course, one set of passengers knows that the other passengers are mostly bad guys who, well, they probably deserve whatever punishment they're suffering, and the criminals on that boat know that that's exactly what the people on the other boat are thinking. You'll have to rent the movie to find out what happens. <laughs> Here's the point. Is the Joker right? 
Is the good that we do just a veneer which covers a potential for wickedness, a veneer which can be scraped away by the right circumstances? You may think I'm kidding when I say that the Joker and St. Paul seem to agree on this point, that however noble may be our intention, there is no amount of good that we could do, no matter how many brownie points we might earn, that will qualify us for righteousness. Earlier in his letter to the Romans, Paul famously put it like this, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he did not exclude himself. He wrote, I do not understand my own actions. I do what I don't want to do and I find myself doing the very thing that I hate. Try to imagine yourself on one of those ferries. You know it's wrong to kill. Of course it's wrong to kill. But what would you do? Paul, who so freely admits that he keeps doing the things he knows he shouldn't do, well, Paul just might blow up the other boat. A preacher was walking down the street when he came upon a, a group of about a dozen kids, all of them about 10 years old. They, were they had surrounded a dog. Concerned for the animal's safety, the cleric demanded to know what was going on. What are you doing with that dog? He asked the kids. It's an old neighborhood stray, one of the boys replied. We all want to take him home, so we decided that whoever tells the biggest lie wins and gets to take home the dog. Relief for the dog, the minister was, however, appalled by this demonstration of competitive mendacity. You boys should not be telling lies, he began, and he went on for some time expounding the virtues of truthfulness. And he ended by saying to the kids, and I want you to know that when I was your age, I never once told a lie. There was silence for about a minute as the kids took this in. They looked at each other, nodded at each other, and then the presumptive leader announced, you win, mister, you can have the dog. <laughs> you see, the kids were wise enough to know that a clerical caller might indicate many things, including a presumed passion for brownie points, but it is no guarantee of righteousness. In his autobiography, Mahatma Gandhi writes that during his early days in South Africa, he attended a church in Pretoria. In his opinion, the congregation did not seem to be particularly religious. He wrote, they were not an assembly of devout souls, but appeared rather to be worldly-minded people going to church for recreation and in conformity to custom. Gandhi concluded that there was nothing in Christianity that he did not already possess. He gave up on Christianity because the behavior of those Christians did not qualify them, in his opinion, as exceptional. They were simply earning brownie points. And if that were the case, Gandhi did not think that they had earned enough. And Paul would say that in the opinion of God, we will none of us ever earn enough. So what do we do? What on earth do we do? Do we give up the pursuit of righteousness as a fool's errand, bound to fail? Do we lower our expectations and keep striving for right behavior in the hope that it will be good enough to make do, that enough of us will be good enough to save this world from chaos and our own right behavior to the extent that we can manage it will earn enough points for us to squeeze through to the next world? Or should we think, rethink this whole business of righteousness? Here again, that old hymn, including the last line of the verse. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All of it, all of it, for sin could not atone. And then, thou must save, O God, thou alone. And today's lesson ends with this. Whoever believes in Jesus will not be put to shame. 
Paul wrote as well, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but we are now justified by the grace of God as a gift. We are justified as a gift through the redemption that is ours in Jesus Christ. No matter how hard we try, the good that we do will never be good enough, but we can become righteous by simply accepting righteousness as a free gift from God. You've got to be kidding me. Or could this possibly be the way it is? Some of you are, uh, who are adopting parents have found it amusing, as Betty and I have, to be told how much your adopted kids look like you. Spitting image, some have said. It's amusing because there is, of course, no genetic connection. And yet adopted children do grow to look more and more like their adopting parents. It's a similarity not based on body shape or skin tone, but on facial expression, style of movement, tonal quality, and even demonstrated character. The similarity of the child and the parent may not result from genetics or even any intentional effort. It is simply a byproduct of association. Adopted children look like us because of the time they spend with us, watching us, listening to us, hearing us. And I'm told the same transformation by association can occur with married couples who often grow through time to look alike, sound alike, and act alike. That's why Betty told me to grow a goatee. <laughs> whatever else, whatever else you believe about salvation, or however else you may struggle with what others profess to believe, know this, it is not possible for any of us to behave ourselves into righteousness. Anyone who does not agree with Paul, anyone who claims to be as good as you want to be and never regrets anything that you have done, well, I got to tell you, you are either deluded or a liar. Every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the glory of God's intention when God made us. None of us knows how thin is the veneer of goodness in us or can say for sure what we would do on that ferry with the detonator in our hand. If our salvation depends on the brownie points we earn for right behavior, then we're probably doomed. But, but our hope is not based in our capacity for right behavior. Our hope is based in the belief that God wants to adopt us, to have such a, a close and intimate relationship with us that our character and our behavior will inevitably more and more reflect the image of God. The best we can be is not the best we can do, but we can what we can become through Jesus Christ. This is a mystery for seekers to ponder and theologians to argue, but it's also as simple as this. In the same way that a child grows into the likeness of the parent who loves her and holds him tight, so are we transformed by the love of God. The Beatles were right. All we need is love because the love of God will save our souls and the love we do can save the world. I'm not kidding. Amen.